Assalamu alaikum. In this presentation, we shall go through how the vocal folds can maintain a self-sustained oscillations for a few hundred times in just a second. The myoelastic aerodynamics theory proposed by Vandenberg in 1958 still forms our current understanding of how the vocal folds vibrations uh, produce the acoustic vibrations. He also suggested that the mechanism for self-sustaining such oscillation is the Bernoulli's effect. Um, but it's now accepted that several other mechanisms can play a, a major role in the self-sustaining of the oscillation and that the Bernoulli effect can actually play only a secondary role. The other two mechanisms that we'll go through in this presentation is first the alternating convergent and divergent uh, glottal canal geometry, and the other one is the inertive properties of the supraglottal air column, the air column from the glottis to the lips. And we shall go through these three possible mechanisms one by one. The condition to have a self-sustained vocal fold vibration is to have asymmetry in the intraglottal canal pressure. The pressure in the intraglottal canal in here. If there is asymmetry providing positive pressure in the opening phase, that would help getting the two vocal folds apart and negative pressure during the closing phase that will pull the medial ends together to close the glottis. This is the condition for self-sustained vocal fold vibrations. The intraglottal canal pressure equation is here. And is, as you can see, the intraglottic pressure is dependent on two entities. The first entity is this, and this is the second entity. The first entity is basically the difference between the subglottic and the supraglottic pressure. If there is more pressure in the subglottic area, it's going to drive air through the canal. But this is multiplied by a certain factor reflecting the configuration of the glottis. If you have a convergent glottis, like in the opening phase, with a larger entry, uh, this is A1, the surface area of the entry into the canal, and A2, the surface area of the exit to the canal. If this is the case, this fraction will be smaller than 1, and you will have positive pressure in the canal. If it is the reverse, when you have a larger A2 than A1, then this uh, factor would be negative and you would have negative pressure in the canal. The second entity is the supraglottal vocal tract pressure. So as we can see, the condition for having an asymmetry in the intraglottal uh, canal can be fulfilled by these two mechanisms, the alternating convergent and divergence of the glottis, and the second mechanism is the inertive properties of the supraglottic tract that determines the second entity, and we shall go through these in this presentation. So we start with the Bernoulli effect. This was the initial proposed mechanism for self-sustained oscillation with repeated cycles of opening and closing of the glottis due to the build-up of pressure when the glottis is closed. Above a certain limit, this pressure is going to drive the vocal folds apart and air would escape, and this would create a stream of air, a jet of air in here with high velocity that is going to create a negative pressure around it, and this would close up the vocal folds again and a new cycle is going to start with a build-up of the pressure, driving the air after a certain limit of pressure up. This would create the Bernoulli effect again, and the vocal folds would close once more, and a new cycle would again start.
but there are now suggestions that the Bernoulli effect is not really necessary for the sustained oscillations and that it fails to explain some aspects of the vibration cycle of the glottis. Without a vertical phase difference in the medial ends of the vocal fold, the vocal fold uh, surface during opening and closing would be identical. This symmetrical flow pressure inside the intraglottic canal and there would be a loss of the asymmetry of the intraglottal canal pressure and consequently a zero transfer of energy from the glottic canal into the vocal folds. The second proposed mechanism to explain the self-sustained oscillation is this the alternating conversions and diversions of the glottis due to the vertical phase difference in the vocal fold vibration. The lower end of the vocal fold medial part always leads the upper end either uh, during uh, the opening phase or during the closing phase. There's always a phase difference between the lower and the upper end and this creates enough uh, asymmetry in the intraglottal pressure to drive the vocal folds uh, widely apart during the opening phase and closer together during the closing phase. Important to know that this property, this phase difference in the vertical phase difference in the medial ends of the vocal fold is actually an intrinsic property of the vocal folds itself due its geometry and its uh, mechanical properties of the material forming the vocal fold. So it's an intrinsic uh, property of the vocal folds itself. And now let's see how this proposed mechanism can actually explain the self-sustained oscillation. Back to the equation of the intraglottal canal pressure, and we see the two entities here that determine the value of the intraglottal pressure. And let's concentrate on the first entity itself, and for now try to uh, neutralize the second entity here by assuming that the pressure and the vocal tract is closer to zero. So this is going to uh, remove this second entity and also will make the difference between the subglottic and the supraglottic pressure equals only to the subglottic pressure itself. So the equation will now be reduced to this. And let's see how this can provide the asymmetry and in the intraglottal pressure during the a vibration cycle. So when this equation is applied during the opening phase of the glottis cycle, when the geometry of the glottic canal is convergent with a larger entry area than an exit area, this fraction would be smaller than one. So this entity would be positive. The positive uh, intraglottic pressure would help in driving the vocal folds apart during the opening phase of the aglotic cycle. And the exact opposite would happen during the closing phase uh, of the vibratory cycle because the configuration would now be divergent with the lower end leading the upper end. And because of this divergence, the area of the exit is larger than the area of the inlet and this will produce a number here that is more than one so this entity would be negative providing a negative uh, intraglottal pressure a negative intraglottal pressure in here would help in getting the vocal folds medial ends closer together towards the midline thereby closing the glottis during the closing phase of the glottic cycle. This graph sums it all. It shows the asymmetry in the intraglottic pressure, resembled here with this thick 
black line. It is positive in the opening phase of the glottic cycle when the geometry of the glottic canal is convergent, like in here, and it is negative in the closing phase of the glottic cycle when the geometry of the canal is divergent, as in here, and it is zero when the glottic entry is equal to the glottic exit area in here. As you can see, the glottic area uh, entry is shown up here. So this is always more than the glottic exit area in the first half of the cycle in the convergent uh, opening phase. And the reverse happened in the divergent phase. The exit surface area of the canal in here is a, uh, demonstrated here in this dotted line is always more than the uh, endlet area. So this would summarize the whole findings. The intraglottal pressure is positive during the opening convergent phase, and it is negative during the closing divergent phase. And note that the maximum positive pressure is at the beginning of the cycle, the very beginning of the uh, opening cycle, when an excess pressure is required to push the medial ends of the vocal folds apart, and it's also a maximum negative in, at the end of the closing phase when some uh, negative pressure is required to abruptly close up the glottis. We now move to the other mechanism that was proposed to explain the self-sustained oscillations of the vocal fold. This third mechanism is the mechanism of the inertive, the mass-like properties of the supraglottal air column, the air column above the glottis in here. And as you can see from the previous equation, this is basically the second entity in here, the entity of the pressure in the supraglottal vocal tract. Um, the equation show that the uh, intraglottal pressure is dependent on two entities and for now, let's try to ignore the first entity that we have been through it with the second mechanism of the convergence and the divergence of the vocal fold canal and concentrate on the second entity. To do this, let's assume that the endlet area A1 and the exit area uh, A2 of the glottal canal are equal. This will make this um, fraction equals to one, one minus one equals zero, and multiplied by this, it will end up as zero as well. So the uh, intraglottal pressure will depend basically only on the supraglottal vocal tract pressure. So now we need to examine what determine the pressure, the input pressure in the supraglottal vocal tract. Uh, it's actually two things in here. The inertia of the air column above the glottis up to the lips and the rate of the glottal flow, the change in the glottal flow over time in here. That is to say the glottal flow through the glottis over a time period. The inertance of the vocal tract is in turn um, calculated from this equation and gives almost uh, a fixed uh, value because it's dependent on the density of the air, the length of the air column in the vocal tract, which is about 17 centimeters or so from the glottis to the lips, and the uh, cross-sectional area of the uh, vocal tract above the glottis, which is about 3.5 centimeters square or so. So this value is almost fixed and the uh, input pressure into the supraglottal vocal tract is dependent on this, on the change in the glottal flow rate. When the glottal flow increases rapidly, this is going to be uh, increased 
and when it decreases rapidly this is going to uh, decrease and this would be reflected through the pressure pi into the pg which is now equal to it so this change in the glottal uh, flow rate is basically dependent on the difference between the subglottic pressure and the supraglottal pressure if this is increased or is increasing in the opening phase then this value is going to increase and increase the input pressure and the intraglottal pressure would also increase and this is going to drive the vocal ends apart during the opening phase and the exact opposite is going to happen in the closing phase when the rate of the change in the glottal flow here is reduced and becomes negative and this will be reflected in the input pressure and consequently on the intraglottal pressure and this was going to drive the uh, medial ends of the vocal cords closer together because the pressure would now be negative. Now again, this graph sums it all. It sums up the changes in the intraglottal pressure that is due to the inertance of the vocal tract air column. We have been through a similar graph for the changes of the intraglottal pressure due to the convergence and the divergence of the glottal uh, entry and exit surface area. And as we can see here, the intraglottal pressure is again positive in the opening phase when there is a positive pressure in the intraglottal canal and negative in the uh, divergent and closing phase when the intraglottal canal is uh, below zero and it uh, reaches a zero point between the uh, changes in the opening phase and the changes in the closing phase. So we have been through these two mechanisms of convergence, divergence, and the inertia of the supraglottal air column and to try and explain why the uh, vocal folds can self-sustain oscillations. Uh, back to the equation, we have seen that there are two entities one of them is the uh, pressure in the supraglottal vocal tract, which is dependent on the inertia and on the change in the glottal flow rate. And the other entity is dependent on the convergence and the divergence of the glottal uh, canal entry and the uh, difference between the subglottus and the supraglottus pressure. So these are the two mechanisms that can explain how the intraglottal pressure uh, have an asymmetry being positive in the opening phase and negative in the closing phase, thereby it drives the vocal fold uh, medial ends apart while the glottis is uh, trying to open and uh, suck them together closer to the midline when the glottis is trying to close up. Uh, in fact, the, we have taken the, uh, the two mechanisms uh, one at a time by trying to neutralize the effect of one side while focusing on the other. But in reality, the two mechanisms would act together to provide the required asymmetry in the intraglottal pressure that is required for self-sustaining the vocal fold oscillations. By this, we come to the end of this presentation on the mechanisms for self-sustained vocal fold oscillations. Salam alaikum.